because we can either search the whole area for the case or just tell you, just got to wait until something comes and they'll let you know, which is what we do. And um, so, so basically, the other thing is that our customers are feeling disconnected because they don't have a caseworker anymore. If they have a problem, they don't know who to call. And our, call, our phones don't get answered because we, have a, we, have, we service about 100,000 cases in Northern. We have one switchboard operator and two people in the call center. So we have a grand total of three people answering the phone calls for an office that services 100,000 cases, which is pretty ridiculous, I think. And so the, the other thing with that is because people don't have caseworkers anymore, they don't feel connected to the services that we're providing. They don't feel connected to anybody. They, they, even though we've been on this plan for two years, they still ask to see their caseworker. They ask for who their caseworker is. And, it's, and also, sometimes they ask for a specific person by name. So it's a, it's, it's a real problem as far as the service providing. And this model that has been introduced in our office for the past two years is now the model for DHS for all the offices, the plan is to eventually roll this out for all offices. Not everybody's doing it yet, but the plan is, as long as the current leadership are there, this bad service delivery plan is their plan for the future. Unless somebody steps up and says no to it, it's gonna, they're going to continue rolling it out. And uh, they talked a little about the Medicaid problem, and I think some of the people here may have already been affected by it, which is the Maximus contract, or the Medicaid Redetermination Project, whatever they call it. Um, so basically, this is, a, this is a plan to save money. They paid an outside contract for a whole lot of money with the hopes of cutting people off of Medicaid. The result is a whole bunch of people that should be on Medicaid are being eliminated. And, and the numbers I've seen of the cancellations, between 33 and 40 percent of the cases canceled as a result of the actions and recommendations from Maximus have to be reinstated. And it's creating a hardship. We have people every day that are coming to our office that have small have children with serious medical conditions and they can't get medical treatment because their case got canceled. It's either because they didn't turn a document in in exactly 10 days or they have very inexperienced workers at that, those offices. They're brand new hires. Most of them are still trainees. And they don't understand the policies. A lot of times they're not applying policies properly and cases are getting canceled that shouldn't be canceled. And I, I, I have personally been involved in quite a few cases already where people have lost their benefits and have children with really, really serious conditions that need medication. They can't get their medication because the case was canceled. And for, it's real easy to cancel a case, but a lot of cases, especially if they've been canceled for more than a month before the person comes in, they have to be completely set up from scratch as if they never existed. And it's a very time-consuming process and only a handful of people have access to be able to do that. So I'm hoping that something can be done both about this Ford Foundation plan, which is a very bad plan, and also something about this thing with the redetermination project, because cases are being canceled unfairly and it needs to stop. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ann Crow, and I am a Medicaid recipient. Um, what Mr. Kramer said about the dehumanization of human services is exactly on point. Um, what happens when you go, if you've never been to the Department of Human Services, um, what happens is you go in and you wait online, sometimes for a half hour, um, and then you Get, you go up to a person and they put your name in the computer and then they tell you to sit down. And you can sit for up to three hours just sitting there waiting to see someone that you don't know. This is the caseworker problem. Uh, I have had the caseworker in the past, but every time I would go to the office it would be a different caseworker. And I think there's someone in the audience that knows this um, because she is a caseworker there. And I've spoken to her about this, uh, this problem. Uh, without a caseworker, you do feel disconnected from the system. If there's nobody who really knows you, nobody to 
see when you go there. You don't know who you're going to see. You don't know who has your paperwork. And you are feeling very, um, like nobody knows what you're going through. And it's true. There's no continuity to the services. Um, every time you go there, it seems like it's a brand new, it's a whole brand new thing. Um, and when you don't have a caseworker, it's really hard to understand like different things like spend downs. I've been trying to find out why I have a spend down for <laughs> months now. It's been months. And every time I go there, I speak to someone different who tells me something different. So, and it's not, it's not the people who work there. I think they're doing their best within the system. It's a systemic problem. It's the way that things are set up now. Um, as Mr. Kramer pointed out, it's a, it's a team system. In other words, your paperwork goes to a particular team. If, you're, if you have a spend down issue, your paperwork goes to the spend down team, supposedly goes to the spend down team. Um, and you really don't know what has happened to your paperwork. I, uh, the last time I was there, I couldn't do it. I couldn't wait online. I couldn't sit there for two and a half hours. So I put my papers in the, in the drop off box which is a joke because when you put your papers in the drop-off box, you don't know whatever happens to them. My papers have been in the drop-off box for a month now, and I never heard anything back from Medicaid as to my spend down. They were my spend down papers. A spend down is what is is like a deductible, an insurance deductible. You have to spend a certain amount of money in order for your Medicaid to kick in. So I had all my bills and everything uh, in order and all my paperwork in order, put it in the drop box. Who the heck knows where it is now? I certainly don't. Okay. And the phone, as Mr. Kramer pointed out, <laughs> the phone, I have to laugh because I've tried to call and you, it's impossible. You can't get a message through to anybody. And because you don't have a caseworker, you don't know who to call. You don't have a message to give to a particular person. So what I'm asking, and I think what a lot of people would like to have, is the old caseworker system where a person has a number of cases where they see you, where they know you, you know them, and we can interface directly with the department. Um, and that is what I have to say about the Department of Human Services. Please humanize it for us. We need it. Thank you.
And, uh, you know, which four will I treat? Which four? What? Well, and everything else just goes out. Um, when the rules change for dual eligibles, people who have both Medicare and Medicaid, which is very fuzzy right now, um, the reality of medication limitations looms further. When, when the low intention prior authorization process was added, there was some hope to obtain sufficient medication. Unfortunately, the prior authorization process yielded unworkable results. Persons at my C4 drop-in center had their medications denied. The reason for the medication denial? Reason. Denied. That was the reason. Denied. Another reason. Uh, denial was already approved. Denied because the drug was already approved. That was from a girl who received a certain amount of medication twice a day, somewhere along for years, somewhere along the line, it got denied. So when when she appealed, that they said it's already been approved, so we're denying this appeal. She still it caused caused several months of hospitalization in frustration. She cut herself from head to toe. She had to be months in the hospital, recovering from physical illness, not from the cutting. And of course, she received her medication, her psychiatric medication, in the hospital, so she did better. And I, I'm happy to say she's back at the doctor's center. I'm really glad to see her. Um, this authorization process is broken and it's dangerous. When one takes medications, as I do, uh, this, this, it affects your de dental health. You have a dry mouth and you're, I have, have a little, a, a little or a uh, big hair. Uh, I have no teeth on the bottom row. I have these three teeth and now my uh, top teeth are coming out. I need dentures and I'm not going to get them because I have no way to pay for them. Um, because of the poor dental health, I have a heart, 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 uh, heart risk problem. So since prescribed medications prevent medical emergencies, hospitalizations, and lower doctor visits, I think Congress would be wise to consider the cost savings by removing the limit of the medications allowed. Just as an economic boost to the Medicaid economy, as far as dental health benefits goes, I'm sure I'm not the only one who is at risk for cardiac disease or a choking emergency or death because of lack of dental care. Thank you for your time. Um, I, I know that uh, in my office, one of the largest number of calls we get about is concerns that people aren't getting enrolled, they're not getting their cases taken care of in the human services department. And we, my staff has spent a lot of time trying to help navigate that. So first, we're always, you know, we and our staffs and our offices are always here to try to help people navigate because we know how overwhelmed they are in the offices. We have been working to authorize getting more people hired. We got, we have in the budget this year hiring more people, and my understanding is that they're having a hard time bringing on enough people. And that we really need to keep that up. We know we need more caseworkers on board. Um, I want to find out, go and visit, and understand what the Ford Foundation plan is. I don't know what that is. And, what they've moved away from and getting back into caseworkers, I think, makes sense that you know somebody there. I totally get that, so I'm glad to learn about that. I look forward to uh, digging into that. Some of the other items, the Maximus contract itself, um, asked me successfully did work a court case on that, so that is getting scaled back. Um, what Maximus can do, so now it does have to be, it's very clear that it has to be DHS caseworkers who have to do this enrollment, so um, we can have confidence that at least that it's people there who know what they're doing who will be making those eligibility determinations. Um, just to give you context about that, I know some folks here probably know why that happened, others don't. When we were, you know, we have a huge state budget problem, and you guys, um, you're gonna hear this through different panels throughout the night, because I'm personally very, very concerned about the state of our budget, and where revenues are going to be coming from in the future because we're going to be facing more cuts if we don't do something on the revenue side. Uh, and we already are hearing and seeing and experiencing how problematic it already is. Um, 
what I would say that when we were doing, sitting around, negotiating around Medicaid because of our budget crisis, um, that was one of the sticking points the Republicans would not give up on was doing the Maximus. Um, and they really, and you hear this from every Republican gubernatorial candidate out there, think that the way we can solve all the state's budget problems are getting people off Medicaid who don't belong on Medicaid. Well, clearly that's not the case. And we just can't keep people off who really belong there. So we really have to address what's going on in the record side. And then the uh, other point I'll make quickly turn over to these guys is, um, uh, on the four prescription, it's not a limit, it is a prior authorization. We are looking at ways of trying to make that work better. Everybody should be getting the medications they need, and if they're not, we really have to make sure that's not the case. And in dental, we're trying to restore the dental benefits that were cut. We passed a bill in the Senate. Um, these guys, I know, support it in the House, but we don't have enough uh, ability to get it out of the House yet. Um, but we're really working on that. So I, you know, um, we're going to keep fighting that, those fights, and we're going to need lots of help on it, and we're going to continue to have revenue challenges, and we really need everyone to help us with the revenue side, too. A lot of what Heather said is, is, is great to what we feel as well in our office. Um, to the issue of the Ford Foundation plan, it is something that we, we actually found ourselves deeply engaged in because of complaints we were getting from customers um, in, in the North office, in the Skokie office. Um, Throughout last summer, um, my staff and interns and I made surprise visits to the Skokie office. We took pictures of bathrooms without doors. We heard stories of toilet paper rationing in other offices. Um, we, we collected nightmare scenarios of phone uh, efforts at reaching, uh, reaching the office by phone and took all of that data. We actually called every day at varying times of the day and kept track, we kept voluminous records of our efforts to make contact. Um, and had a series of conversations with um, the secretary and staff uh, of DHS to, to attempt to address all of the issues. The bathrooms do have doors now, I hear. Um, there's no more toilet paper rationing happening in other offices. Um, the initial fix for the phone problem actually is <coughs> worse, but I'm pleased to report that um, our most recent round of calls, we actually had three out of the five numbers answered by a human being. So there is improvement. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, and, and in one case, we actually had a, a constituent who's, who's got an ongoing problem get an answer. We, we had her call with her problem and get an answer just to, to sort of test the system again. Um, to, the, to the caseworker issue, though, we've had several conversations with leadership at DHS about the problem and about really using the same language. This is, this is not human services. That we're not treating. We're not treating folks like customers, we're not treating them like, like human beings, and that this, this effort at efficiency is not only not efficient, it's inhumane. Um, and so we have pressed that message and continue to do so, um, and have uh, pushed very hard for this not to be expanded into other offices, because it's not, it, it isn't working. Um, I am supporting um, efforts to, to make the, the, the four drug um, guidelines more accessible to folks, and dental in particular, it's something we hear from folks a lot. Um, we've spent, we spent a lot of time trying to get folks access to alternative ways of getting care. Um, I, in fact, we have, we have the Skokie office make, rep, make referrals. If you call Matt Muir in Kelly Cassidy's office, she can take care of your problem. So we jokingly refer to him as the additional Skokie caseworker now. Um, but, but we do, it is so good to hear the real stories and, and really to be able to point to someone um, as, as, a, as an example of, of what needs to be done differently. So please keep bringing us um, these stories and, and, and let us help you as much as we can. Okay, uh, my name is Greg Harris. Uh, I'm a representative of the 15th District. It's Uptown, Ravenswood, Lincoln Square, Bowmanville, Westbridge, just uh, to the west and the south of us. Uh, just to give you an idea, I, I, I chair the uh, Appropriations Committee in the House, uh, under which uh, the Department of Human Services, Healthcare and Family Services, Aging, DCFS, DOORS, Veterans Affairs, and Public Affairs get their budgets. And in the Senate, uh, Heather Staines is the chairman of the counterpart uh, budget committee for the Senate, the Appropriations Committee. So, I mean, between us, the decisions that guide the agencies you're concerned with tonight, this is where they get made. So we're really glad, I think, to hear directly from you about these things, but I'll just go back to what Heather started with, is that 
if we do not fix our revenue problem as, as a state, if we do not get a graduated income tax so that the, the wealthiest people in our state are paying their fair share, if we do not close, if we do not close corporate loopholes so that these companies which right now are not paying any income taxes, in our state, All we're going to be doing amongst each other is scuffling for the crumbs. And that's not where we ought to be. And you know, I got another meeting I got to go to. So I just wanted to plug the, the most important thing we all need to do tonight is look at new revenue. Because if we can bring in adequate revenue to pay for enough people to uh, serve our customers in the DHS office or pay a living wage to our home care workers and our nursing home workers, that we need the revenue to do it. So that being said, let me just talk to some of the really excellent points made by the panel. And uh, to the folks from ASME uh, who are, are working in the offices and, and to Anne you know, who has to go there, when you, it, it, the name of that office is Human Services. So service ought to be driving thing that you know, people go in there for. It should not be automation, it should not be fill out forms, it should not be standing in lines. And we need, you know, um, I know Anne knows me, and you know, if you have a problem, you know, call me, call Heather, call Kelly. We need to track some of these individual cases to be sure that the folks are getting dealt with appropriately. You know, as far as the redeterminations, we did uh, add 600 new employees to the DHS budget this year to begin to you know, pick up on the processing of applications and redeterminations of SNAP, of Medicaid, of dual eligibles. Uh, we gave uh, some extra money to Cook County, but there are still hundreds more workers needed to keep up with the workload that's before them, and that's something we need to uh, attend to with our colleagues. Um, I, I, I think I would join these guys saying, you know, we were opposed to the whole idea of Maximus, the, the hiring you know, outside you know, companies to go through our Medicaid roles probably isn't the best idea when we should have you know, folks within state government you know, who know our systems and know our people doing that work. You know, so I think we support keeping that within the department. As far as some of the questions on the prior authorization and the uh, um, uh, dental health, I met with the Medicaid director um, this Wednesday for a few hours, and I asked her, I said, you know, you need to get us now uh, that this has been in effect for a year or two. I want to see some data. Like, what are we paying in additional hospitalizations for people with diagnoses like, you know, mental health problems of different kinds, whether it's schizophrenia or uh, bipolar disorder or you know, other severe mental illness? What are we seeing with uh, emergency department visits? What are we seeing with inpatient visits? What are we seeing with diagnoses related to dental problems? Because I will bet you that if we look at those figures, we're going to find out that while we're trying to save money, we're spending money to do it, which doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense. And if those numbers are there, then we need to work with our colleagues to you know, educate them on those facts and restore the services so that we're doing prevention. And you know, we're working with people like Thresholds and uh, Orsees and folks like that to you know, gather this information so that we have validation from both sides. So um, I think that's what I'm going to say. So. Speaking on the importance of community nonprofit safety net and the frontline caregivers, we will hear from Paula Haley. She's the training coordinator at Envision Unlimited. Gail Jackson, Oscar Townsend, and Michael Watson. They are workers and stewards at Envision Unlimited. And David Wendowski, a consumer of Annex Thirst Center. I am Paula Haley, a training counselor and chief steward and Envision Unlimited. You are about to hear a pal of frontline human service workers and consumers about the experiences on a day-to-day -day basis as a result of the inadequate funding and social services. Their testimony explains a request that you make a passage of SB 2604, a top priority. The bill will increase fees for services and pay to community agencies like Envision and Addixter, it would specifically mandate that the money go to the series of wages increases to all direct care DSP workers. 
and then all will be paid not less than $13 per hour by July 2016. We of course know, Senator Staines, that you are sponsoring the bill and we want to thank you and congratulate you for that good work. We are asking you to make it top priority and we are asking for state rep to make it a top priority in the House. We are also asking you to endorse and principle the concept of legislation that would go further and eventually guarantee that at least $50 per hour to all health care and social service workers who provide Medicaid services in any form by relieving the poverty suffered by many workers, it would actually save the state money. Our first speaker would be Gail Jackson, and she's a training counselor and steward at Envision. At Envision, we have a lot of, we have a very dedicated red care staff who go beyond their regular demand, demanding jobs, descriptions, and duties. Palace is the site where I work at. We have three units. Each unit has two direct care staff, and we each have 20 to 22 adults with developmental disabilities on our caseload. And if someone is uh, out on vacation or sick, that means we have 40 or more. Annually, we have a picnic and a Christmas party for our clients and a luncheon for the ones who participate in special living. The red care staff, we do all the shopping, we do all the cooking, and we don't do this to get brownie points. We do this because we care and we have compassion in our hearts for the people that we serve. And in order for this to be free to our clients, the direct care staff, we have fundraisers. So sometimes this means that we miss lunch and we miss our breaks so we can meet our goals. And when a client comes to work without their proper clothing or come with no lunch, this same direct care staff, we pitch in together and make sure that they have the appropriate and necessary clothes and lunch. In 2010, I took on the role as head coach for Special Olympics, and I organized men's fest for over 30 Olympians, and I continue to schedule all functions related to their participation. Now it's over 40 that I do, and I also train them for their events. Once a week, our clients have the choice to order lunch out. This means I have to take orders, take the money, organize the orders, call the orders in, and then once they get their initial amount. And my clients like that. Uh, this is just a few of the things that we do for the people we serve. But yet, after 20 years of this dedicated service, I don't make $25,000 a year. I don't get paid enough to buy and maintain a home, nor help secure the future of my grandchildren. I care, you care, we win. Pass Bill SB 2604. Our next speaker is Michael Watson, steward and advocate with the Annexter Center who work and live in your district. My name is Mike Watson. I'm um, Stein. I currently live at 2357 West Jarvis, which is in Chicago, in, in, which is in your district. I work for Anderson and the Thomas Cellar. My position is an advocate and caregiver for the individual with disability. I work for Anderson since, since July of 2009. I like you. My salary started at 20, and I'm at 21. Right? That for over a five year period, I only got a thousand dollar raise. Now, I want to discuss the issue of low wages that we are currently get, uh, getting and the importance of the uh, passage of SB 2604. This, this bill is important to our, uh, for our survival and sustainability with the high cost of living that I have to endure and the college loans that I have, which, I, uh, which I cannot even begin to pay back. I live from paycheck to paycheck. I have to decide whether I have to pay bills or to eat on a day-to-day -day basis. In brief, Madam Senator, 
pass this bill. Help us decide whether we will live or just survive. Because the quality of our lives will determine the quality of the lives of the people that we take care of. And in short, I mean these facetious. My money's funny. I ain't laughing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Oscar Townsend, a lead community living specialist and also a steward in Envision. Good evening, everyone. My name is Oscar William Townsend III. I am employed by Envision Unlimited as a lead staff member at the community residence for developmental and disabled people. I stand before you today as a representative and union steward for community living and social service. I believe working class family deserves every possibility to be able to thrive in this very difficult economy. By giving a wage increase promised by two, SB 2604, we will be taking a giant step forward in better protecting working class family and also providing a resource to those who are in the greatest need of human service. Human service workers deserve the opportunity to live in dignity and not live paycheck to paycheck. I know that to, a, to qualify for a raise, we have to add value to the work we do. In my job, I do not just come to work and do the same thing day in and day out. That wouldn't justify a pay increase. I actively make a difference. That is what creates value. For example, at my job, I go above and beyond the call each day to deal creatively with situations where severely disabled people, though no fault of their own, act out in different ways. I think, I think on my feet and deal with these situations in ways that respect the people's dignity and self-determination. So the pay increase is for value provided to the consumers, the agency, and the whole community. Thank you. Last but not least, David Winkowski, a consumer of services for both Annexter and Envision, who also lives in your district. Hello, ladies. Hello. My name is David Jowinkowski. Hi, my name is David Jowinkowski. I live in your district. 1646, West Essex. I attend a day program at an agency. An agency named Anderson Center. Funding. Caps, cuts, have really hurt agencies expressed own work, work our program. One of the staff passed away. The agency did not have the money to replace him. As a result, also a our work programs was cut in half. Also, a lot of staff left. Agency fund for better paying jobs. I have lived in an apartment with a roommate. We have staff that help us budget our money to pay bills, buy food. Some of the staff work two jobs, make ends meet. 
I hope your bill passed so the staff can make more money. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. My name is David
of the labor movement, of the civil rights movement, and of welfare rights reform, which was uh, struggle-led by a number of mainly black women who are on welfare. And so what we see is a reverse, reverse of this broadening out of human services into what is called a mega office. In our uh, local, we had an office called Wicker Park, which was located over on Milwaukee Avenue, in, uh, right near the L on the bus line. Lower North is located on, uh, basically you're not able to get there directly on a bus. You have to walk from Western Avenue three blocks uh, through recycling plants to get to that office. And in that office, we've had three mergers. The Wicker Park office got merged with the Homo Park office with a politically connected landlord who gets half a million dollars a year for a building that had no asbestos. This slumlord lives out in uh, uh, Oak Park Terrace, and he's politically connected with Tony Parikma. Uh, the newest merger in our local was the Broadway office, which is three blocks down the street. And um, we now have over 300 members, mainly new, in that office. And um, that, that landlord also gets a very large amount of money for that office. That's one way for the state to recap, re uh, oop, revenue is not to allow these leases to go on uh, with these ex exorbitant rates. My, uh, in my office, I think the uh, landlord gets downtown real estate prices. Uh, it gets something like uh, two-thirds of a million in rent every year. So that's something the committee should really, this committee would like the legislators to look into. If you want to save money, that's one way to do it. On top of that, the landlords do not uh, keep the office up to code. We had a flood in the back of Lower North, September 17th, still not repaired. We got mold, old mold all over the back of the building and flooded the case records and uh, the clerk unit had to move out of the back of the office. Um, the problem, problem with the mega offices is that uh, uh, simply work methods simply do not work in uh, delivering services to clients. The uh, job that we do is very complex. If you want us to do it right, give us the time and the tools to do it. Uh, we're rushed. You know, when you have 2,000 people, you know, it's, um, I think it's very cynical because the, uh, the clients themselves are desperate and so they're, we're the frontline workers. We're where they connect with the state. So they're going to get angry at us when we're not delivering services. It's impossible to deliver timely services when you're dealing with 2,000 people. You know, it's, it's unrealistic and, uh, okay, they um, still have not hired very many people in my office in Lower North. So, uh, I want Patrick to make a few comments about the new office of Broadway. Hello, my name is Patrick Johnston. I'm an employee of 5050 Broadway. I'm a, a new employee of the Department of Human Services and I've been working there since uh, June of this year, but I'm also a resident of this neighborhood. I live two blocks from the office on the same street, actually, as Representative Harris. And uh, the experience of working in this building, which I've observed over the years, is pretty shocking. Um, we are working on a floor where the, where for six months we worked in an office tower um, that was full of office suites where we had one janitorial worker who was apparently working at three different buildings, two of which were downtown, aside from our building. And so you can imagine the rate at which our garbage was changed or our floors were cleaned. 
it was uh, so disgusting that we had to have an exterminator come into the building at some point, and that's actually something we had to lobby for. The floors haven't been cleaned apparently for 10 years. There's clearly mold growing out of the ventilation ducts. We work on a floor with at least probably 400 people, and there are literally six places to urinate in on our floor. It's really, really, uh, obviously not a place that was meant to be uh, a service place, and especially not a place to service customers who are going to be coming into that office. Most especially, when I'm sure they drive just south of here, that's where the office is. There is absolutely no, no parking in, in that neighborhood. It's a neighborhood where in our block club we've been lobbying for years to try to get uh, permit parking uh, just commercially. And it's not even something that I mentioned at the block club because I know how passionately they would love to use this as an excuse to not allow people to park uh, in our neighborhood. But so I ride my bike there in the morning and it's like riding through a little war zone all the people who are I'm desperate to try to get a parking place in the neighborhood. I have uh, co-workers coming up to me asking me where they can buy a cheap bike so that they can actually uh, ride there. And uh, I'm afraid to tell them because there's not that many places to even chain up your bike on that block. Um, but obviously the state didn't consider parking and I don't understand how we're going to be a facility that's going to continue to service the public. Uh, a public that needs to to drive there or, or to get there and not have any place literally for people to park. Um, and the other aspect, of course, is that I'm working in an office where the state is trying to experiment with minimizing the amount of service that people who are on public aid receive and, um, and in a way sort of trying to make public aid work like unemployment where you just call in for your benefits. So you have even less uh, contact with a uh, caseworker or a professional who's going to be overseeing, you know, the main lifeline your family has to receive food and those sorts of things. And um, that in itself is kind of dispiriting. But also to, to be on that telephone and to talk every day to uh, people from all around the state who are, you know, their life depends on food stamps. This transition that we're having with um, minimizing the offices and uh, also this bringing up all the new online workers. There isn't a single person who comes up for a food stamp recertification who's a client who does not experience a one month to two month break in benefits. And it's just really, that's just absolutely shameful. So um, hopefully these are things that you can bring back when you go back to work. Thank you. Um, I understand there are 85 new employees in the pipeline to come back in, um, but we have brought up the parking issues and the flow through the lobby. There's an issue about accessibility yes. in front of the building. There's metered parking for the handicap and the sidewalks are not uh, cleared enough when it snows. I, you know, we haven't discussed the snow issue with the department. We did talk about the accessibility and the, and the parking and, and the ability to get into the lobby and make your way to where you need to go. Um, they're aware. They're trying to work with the landlord and, and trying to improve it. And, uh, the bathroom situation was brought up. I got an email from the department today. The bathroom situation is also on their to-do list. Um, but you've given us reason to, to start doing the, the sly visits that we did. So people will start coming to you. Exactly. One thing I wanted to add about parking is that um, the Southeast Asian Center, which is right there in that corner, owns that parking space across the street, and I don't know why they don't lease it out. Maybe that's something. Well, we, we can talk to them definitely. We'll talk to the Southeast Asian uh, Center about it. And yeah, as Kelly said, I think we have good spots that have popped in on Monday. Go and check it out. Um, you know, I, I, I will repeat, we have been authorizing hiring more folks for the jets offices. We know we need that. They're supposed to be getting 85 more in to the Broadway one. That's what we've been hearing so we should be seeing them come online. Um, I don't know whether it will be a little about the 600 that we authorized this year, but they haven't even filled them all yet. They're having a hard time keeping up, and turnover, as you know, probably because of these kind of conditions, continues to be an issue also. Um, so it's an ongoing battle. Hearing these stories obviously helps us bring the department. The department does try to respond to us. We do, uh, you do have appropriation chairs here, so they want to. <coughs> so this is very helpful information. Thank you. The central fallacy of austerity is that we are broke, and the primary approach to budget problems is to cut services. Speaking of
on at least two good ways to address the revenue problem would be Pauline Turlo of Ask Me 2858 and Kevin Brown of Northside Action for Justice and Jennifer Edwards of Communities Organized to Win. Hello! <laughs> scream about fiscal cliffs and the need for budget cuts and the unaffordability of public sector pensions, public services, services for the poor and disabled. The reality is not that we can't afford public services and public pensions. The reality is that the rest of us, the little people, cannot afford the wealthy. The wealthy are destroying America. But we in Illinois can take back some of the power and restore and preserve our great state by making rich people pay a more fair share of taxes. Preserve our great state by making rich people pay a more fair share of taxes. Currently, Boeing corporate CEO James McNerney made $27.5 million in 2012, and he pays the same taxes as someone making minimum wage at McDonald's. Is that fair?
Who here is a member of any union, community, or disabled rights organization, or just a, a member of the human race and supports the financial transaction tax and a progressive graduated state income tax? Please stand and remain standing. Now that you're standing, will you fight for it? on this one, so thank you. Um, you know, I support both of those. We had first done in the Senate, we tried doing the um, progressive income tax, you know, taxing wealthier people at a higher rate than uh, lower income people. Uh, four years ago, I was a chief co-sponsor then. Unfortunately, we only got 19 votes in the Senate. You need 30 to pass something. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done on this. Uh, so we are going to need all of you fighting for it. Um, the other thing I just think you guys have to understand is if we get this, the way this is actually going to work, getting the progressive income tax, so that wealthier people pay more in tax than um, lower income folks, we first, it's, it's in our state constitution, so we first have to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot, then you need to get 60% of the people who vote for that, uh, who, 60, you know, 60% 60 of the people who vote on that issue to vote yes, that they support it, then um, that means we are um, able to pass a statute that changes the tax structure. This is a very long process. That does not solve our immediate budget problem this year where we have the income tax starting to go away and a revenue drop that we're going to have to try to still do a balanced budget around. So in addition to working on these things, you guys need to know we need to be doing work on extending the current income tax now so that we don't have another budget cut that we need to do right now. So I think you need to be looking at adding that to your revenue agenda, not just the Robin Hood tax and the graduated income tax, but doing something so we're not facing another cut right now, which is really upon us uh, as we speak. Um, so I absolutely support these, and I'm going to be fighting more. I have been in all my time there. I don't think there's been a revenue bill that came to the Senate that I haven't been a yes on, uh, and will certainly continue to do so. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, I think what I said earlier, which is we need to we need to take this and take your boots to to the streets and districts that aren't represented by people like Heather and me and Greg. Um, and I certainly will be taking my boots into those districts to get it done because it's going to be a tough battle and it's worth fighting. In the 20 some years I've been doing political organizing in, in Chicago, this is the first time I've even had hope. And I'm very excited to be part of it and to have an opportunity to, to, to try to make that happen. But Heather's absolutely right. We have to have, this is a multi-front multi battle that we're fighting. We need to make sure we plug the hole this year so that we can make the long-term solution possible. Ford applied in, in uh, 
of manufacturing cars where a person could just do one thing all day long, just do one thing, and, and then it would be an assembly line. And, and, it's, and it, really took, uh, it really took people's pride in their work away from them because, you know, it's very wonderful to build a car, but to just put a door on all day or something like that. This is, this is what's called Taylorism. And um, it's even worse to apply this kind of an efficiency system to human services. And um, I, I wanted to say also that um, uh, what this means is that people who don't know anything about it are making the decisions. And they don't have any idea what human services means. Uh, and this applies to many things like global warming, where people who don't know anything about global warming uh, uh, cause doubt about global warming. And I had several other examples. That when tobacco was, uh, when we were trying to do the tobacco thing, that people who didn't know anything about human health would stand up and say the tobacco doesn't hurt anybody. And the other one I wanted to say is that today, scientists are standing, scientists are standing up and saying GMOs won't hurt anybody. And um, they are, and the, the, the scientific work has been done. So, okay, I, I just wanted to express that opinion. We will be closing out with a song. Hey, oh,